Good morning. My name is Sarah Fitzgerald, and on behalf of the Board of Directors of the United Church of Christ's Office of Communications, Inc., I want to welcome you to the 35th Annual Everett C. Parker Lecture, Ethics in Telecommunications Lecture and Awards Breakfast. We want to extend a special welcome to all of you who are joining us via our live feed on the internet. And for those who would like to participate on Twitter, we encourage you to use the hashtag ParkerLecture2017. The annual Parker Lecture is a special time for all of us, whether we come from a spiritual community or an advocacy group, whether we are public servants or professional communicators. Last year's Parker Lecture was held just a few weeks before the presidential election. The Reverend Tracy Blackman, who delivered the 2016 lecture, came to national prominence as a clergywoman in Ferguson, Missouri. In her remarks, she acknowledged that it was easy for her to demonize the candidate she did not support, but reminded us that we cannot do unto others that which we do not want done unto us. Immediately after the lecture, several of us gathered for more discussion, and we shared our concerns about the sad state of polarization in our country. We knew that a good deal of healing would need to take place once the election was over, and we talked about ways we could provide, promote that. Looking back now on that discussion, I think we were all incredibly naive. We could never have predicted the chain of events that had taken place since Election Day, including, just a few weeks ago, a president threatening to revoke a network's broadcast licenses because he disagreed with its news coverage. But the events of the past year underscore why the Parker Lecture remains important to so many of us, providing a chance for us to come together again to listen and to learn to honor our history and to recall earlier struggles for justice and to gain perspectives on the struggles that still go on. We should note that this is the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation, which began with an activist nailing a proclamation on a church door, a societal seismic shift that was facilitated by a rapid change in printing technology at the time. There are many challenges that we still face, but even when we disagree about some issues or the best means to achieve certain ends, we hope the Parker Lecture is a place where we can still have a civil discussion about our disagreements, even as we stand up for such non-negotiable principles as preserving freedom of speech and acknowledging the inherent worth of every human being. In the United Church of Christ, we believe that faith-based organizations are most effective in speaking truth to power when they can join forces across a wide variety of faith traditions. Each year when we plan the Parker Lecture, we always welcome the opportunity to include elements in our program that will speak to the hearts and faith traditions of our honorees, and we are pleased to do so again today. Kyra Jewel Lingo is a Buddhist who served for 15 years as a nun in the Order of Inner Being, which was founded by the Vietnamese peace activist Thich Nhat Hanh. Thich Nhat Hanh was a friend and colleague of Martin Luther King Jr. and in 1967, Reverend King nominated the Buddhist monk for the Nobel Peace Prize. Kyra Jewell edited Nhat Hanh's book, Planting Seeds, Practicing Mindfulness with Children, and today continues to lead programs designed to help both children and adults learn more about meditation and mindfulness. We are pleased that she could join us this morning to offer our invocation. Good morning. I invite us to take a moment to just feel our bodies and to feel ourselves sitting on our chairs and allow ourselves to have a moment of rest and ease. to feel the breath coming in and coming out. And to realize that in this moment we can simply be here. We don't have to go anywhere. We don't have to do anything. 
And that is a moment of happiness, of freedom. And as the Mohawk native peoples say, now our minds can come together as one. And we're really here, fully, body and mind together. And then we can really do something together. I just want to begin this invocation by recognizing and honoring our native land ancestors, the Piscataway peoples, the particular Piscataway tribe that was residing here in the DC area were the Nakochtank peoples. So I just want to begin by offering respect to these land ancestors. And this is a prayer of the Dagara peoples of West Africa. May all ancestors join force to wake up our spirit and put good thoughts into our minds. Then we shall see the good that awaits us and accept it. As this is an event which honors those who know how to listen and to deeply respond to the needs in the world, I would like to share a chant, a, a kind of prayer, invoking the name of the Bodhisattva of Great Compassion, a Buddhist uh, archetype. The name is Avalokita, a being whose name means the one who knows how to listen to the cries of the world. We invoke your name, Avalokiteshvara. We aspire to learn your way of listening in order to help relieve the suffering in the world. You know how to listen in order to understand. We invoke your name in order to practice listening with all our attention and open-heartedness. We will sit and listen without any prejudice. We will sit and listen without judging or reacting. We will sit and listen in order to understand. We will sit and listen so attentively that we will be able to hear what's being said and what's being left unsaid. We know that just by listening deeply, we already alleviate a great deal of pain and suffering in the world and in others. So I invite us all to touch the source of great compassion in each of us that is capable of listening deeply like that with the only wish to relieve suffering. Thank you. Thank you, Kyra Jewell. This event and OC Inc.'s work throughout the year would not be possible without the generous support of our sponsors. As I read off your names, please let everyone know where you are sitting so we can recognize you. Please hold your applause until I announce all of the names. Our lead sponsor, Comcast, NBC Universal, Google, and the Media Democracy Fund. Our patrons, Charter Communications and the National Association of Broadcasters, Track Phone Wireless, and the United Church of Christ. 
Our corporate special friends, the law firm of Kelly Dry and Warren, NCTA, the Internet and Television Association, and the law firm of Wiley Rhine. Our special friend, the law firm of Best Best and Krieger, and our nonprofit special friend, the Benton Foundation. Please join me in giving all of our sponsors a round of applause. We wanted to acknowledge several persons who we were pleased were able to join us today. We were pleased that Federal Communications Commissioner Minyoung Clyburn was able to stop by before she had to leave to attend an open meeting of the commission. And we welcome the Honorable Inez Smith-Reed, retired as Senior Judge of the District of Columbia Court of Appeals and a member of the Board of Directors of the United Church of Christ. Judge Reed, way back there, you should be up closer, so welcome. Oh, and the commissioner is still here, I'm sorry too. Very distinctive in her goldenrod suit today. I shouldn't have missed it. Thank you for staying on. We're so glad you were able to. We're also pleased that other staff members of the SCC and Capitol Hill were able to join us today, as well as a number of previous Parker lectures and honorees. This time, we'd like to also express our appreciation to our meeting planner, Colette Fazard, and her staff for all their hard work on our behalf. And thanks also to Reverend Sidney Fowler and Byron Adams and the staff here at First Congregational United Church of Christ for all their help and support this year's lecture and running around a lot this morning. I'd now like to call on Cheryl Williams to bring greetings on behalf of the national setting of the United Church of Christ. Thank you, Sarah. Good morning. I'm Cheryl Joseph Williams. I'm Chief Strategy Officer at the National Office of the United Church of Christ. And I am really pleased to be here with you today, representing the national setting as we celebrate this wonderful and important event in the life of our denomination. I do want to take a moment to just recognize and have Sandy Sorensen to stand. Sandy, if you're still here. Sandy is the director of, our, of the UCC's Washington, D.C. office and plays a critical role uh, in the work we're able to do regarding advocacy and public policy. So last summer, the UCC gathered up the road in Baltimore for our biennial denominational meeting, our General Senate. On that occasion, the Reverend Dr. John Dorhauer, our General Minister and President, unveiled plans for a two-year initiative that we call the Three Great Loves. The Three Great Loves will seek to focus the work of our churches on three important areas, the love of neighbor, the love of children, and the love of God's creation. And so in these ways, over the next two years, we will continue our work towards building and attaining a just world for all. So here's a short video to help you understand what Three Great Loves are all about. And if you watch very closely, you may see a few familiar people and places. God with our whole heart, mind, soul, and strength, and our neighbor is ourselves. The vision of the United Church of Christ is united in Christ's love, a just world for all. And we have a choice as people of faith, as people of love, as people of compassion, a choice between hatred and love. Our mission, united in spirit and inspired by God's grace. We love all. In the United Church of Christ, we believe that couples should be able to enjoy all the rights, all the blessings that their faith traditions have to offer. And on this historic day, the U.S. Supreme Court agreed. We welcome all. Justice for all. 
we're here to talk about stopping this pipeline, but it's deeper than that. We're here to talk about that relationship that humanity has with Mother Earth. It's something that brought us together has disrupted our peaceful way of life and threatens to take uh, drinking water, which is a matter of life and death. Our vision, to build a just world for all. We are one in the spirit and we should all see ourselves as brothers and sisters and all look for peace and justice in this world. Every day, in every setting, the United Church of Christ embodies love of neighbor. And envisions a just world for all. a just world for all. We need to listen to each other, to understand each other's perspectives. By opening our hearts and our minds and our ears. By helping a refugee family get a new lease on life. We just need to have more empathy for each other. and To understand what we want for our world. and To make sure that we look at what each person needs and meet them where they are. Where we don't step over the poor in an emergency room. We have a conversation so that we can learn from each other. To really understand the stories of people as they continue to try to struggle to live in dignity and to live with respect. This is how we make a just world for all. For the UCC. A just world for all, because this is God's world, not ours. The work of OC Inc., the Media Justice Ministry of the UCC, is an important and extremely critical part of the Three Great Loves Initiative. Without open, just, diverse, and locally accountable media outlets, we cannot share our message of welcome to all. We cannot organize and speak with one another to find solutions to our common problems. And we cannot ensure that our children have access to appropriate and enriching content. Nor can we speak out to our leaders in support of policies that will protect our earth and its people. For example, OC Inc.'s ongoing faithful internet campaign continues to demonstrate the importance of an open internet to faith communities for both advocacy and mission. OC Inc.'s work to lower the outrageous cost of communicating with those in jails and in detention centers helps us to live out Jesus' command in the Gospel of Matthew to visit our neighbors in prison. And OC Inc.'s efforts to bring broadband to low-income communities helps ensure that today's children have the resources that they need to succeed. So thank you all for all of the ways in which you continue to support our continuing work to welcome and create a just world for all. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. As we reflected on our denomination's current focus, those of us who were involved with OC Inc. recalled all of those in the public interest community who worked over decades to ensure that broadcasting remained a force that could help educate our nation's children. As we reflected on the love of neighbor, we recalled this story from the later years of Everett Parker's life. When his wife's health declined, he hired a woman named Liliana to come clean his house. When he learned that her family was sharing a two-bedroom home with several other families, he invited Liliana and Romarose and their daughter Christina to move into his own home. 
He took Christina under his wing, helping her with reading and homework and encouraging her academic pursuits. Two more children came along, and as Everett aged, Liliana and Roma Rose began, became his full-time caregivers. Everett's pastor told Everett's son that, quote, no amount of money could buy the quality of care that Everett ultimately received from the family. At Everett's funeral, Christina spoke about the love and support she had received from the man she now called Granddad, and how he had made a point of showing up at every one of her school events over the years. Truman said he believes the love and devotion that Christina's family showed his father was one of the main reasons Everett Parker lived to the age of 102. In an email Truman sent us, he noted that when he was in divinity school, he had been taught that one aspect of the maturation of faith is the ability to treat different groups of people as family members, connected and drawn together in the faith. Everett's final years were a demonstration of that maturity, as well as commitment to walking the talk until the very end of his life. I'd now like to introduce the Reverend Jim Antal, the Massachusetts Conference Minister of the UCC and a member of OC Inc.'s Board of Directors to present our first honoree. Thank you, Sarah. It's my pleasure to be with you this morning and to introduce the recipient of this year's Donald H. McGannon Award. In 1987, OC Inc. established this award to honor the legacy of Donald McGannon, who served for more than 25 years as president of Westinghouse Broadcasting Company. Mr. McGannon played many leadership roles, but today, we remember him especially for his efforts to create more opportunities for women and persons of color in the telecommunications industry. This year, we honor Ravi Kapoor, the founder and CEO of Dia TV. Ravi is quintessential McCannon honoree, a driven entrepreneur who has used the media to serve his own community and all of us by bringing an amazing array of Asian cultures and languages to our nation's airways. His most recent project is Daya TV, the first 24-hour U.S. broadcast network targeted to serve South Asian audience, reaching more than 70 million people in more than a dozen markets. Before founding Daya TV in 2009, Ravi became the first Indian American to own a full power TV station in this country. His first broadcasting venture, KAXT TV in San Francisco, developed programming to serve the Bay Area's African American, Hispanic, South Asian, Vietnamese, Chinese, Taiwanese, Korean, and Filipino communities, and Ravi led the station to its first Emmy in 2013. Daya TV now offers programming in Hindi, English, Punjabi, Urdu, Marathi, and Bengali, and can be viewed in markets as far flung as Los Angeles to Boston, Houston to Detroit, including those stations that Ravi owns. Ravi is also an entrepreneur who is not afraid to make his views known. Because he has been so involved in creating business ventures that serves traditionally underserved communities, he has first-hand experience with the barriers, regulatory or otherwise, that can block success. Ravi has not hesitated to speak truth to power about the impact of congressional and FCC decisions on media ownership opportunities in this country. It's my pleasure to introduce this year's recipient of the Donald H. McGannon Award, Ravi Kaper. Please come up. that, but I will 
In the spirit of this incredible venue, uh, thank you all for inviting me here. I am uh, beyond humbled. Uh, first, I want to wish you a happy Diwali, um, given the uh, scenario that, we're, that we have here. Diwali just concluded. It's a five-day festival of lights, uh, and it's celebrated by millions of Hindu Sikhs and Jains across the world. This festival uh, coincides with the Hindu New Year, and it celebrates new beginnings and the triumph of good over evil and light over darkness, and I think we can always celebrate that. Um, first of all, thank you, UCC, for uh, this honor. Earl, Cheryl, Jim, uh, Rashad Brinko, congratulations. Um, just to be associated in some form or fashion uh, with the likes of Dr. Parker and Mr. McGannon, uh, it's overwhelming, and there is so much more work that I know needs to be done. Facilitating access to the airwaves for women and minorities has seemed, frankly, uh, obvious to me uh, for most of my adult life. Uh, as a San Francisco native, diversity is a way of life. And it never made sense to me, and it still doesn't, why there is not full representation in media ownership, management, and talent of the communities of color, especially all of those folks that were around me. I understood at a very young age the influence media has in our society, and I set out to try to understand the industry at a very base level. Because of the incredible support I received from my parents and now my wife, this journey in media has taken me from the Bay Area to Syracuse, New York, go orange, to Champaign, Illinois, Eugene, Oregon, Jackson, Tennessee, Salinas, California, Chicago, Illinois, and Fargo, North Dakota. I have lived in most of these places, so my ties to most of these areas run deep and has informed my perspective on the role media has in our society. At my core, I'm a journalist. I worked as a very, very, very low paid anchor, reporter, and producer for a slew of TV and radio stations. So it really does boggle my mind that I am perhaps the only working journalist that owns a full power television station in the United States. Frankly, my story and our business should not even exist. Serving the needs of diverse communities should have been done decades ago. But here we are in 2017 with the same excuses that are made today as when Dr. Parker and Mr. McGannon were pounding the pavement. I have been a media ownership for nearly a decade now buying into my first television station, a Class A low-power TV station in San Jose, right as the broadcast television industry transitioned from analog to digital. The station had been a failure for more than 20 years. It did not have any cable or satellite coverage, nor any call letters that had any resonance in the Bay Area. There was no venture capital for this endeavor, as wonderful as that might have been. Nobody in their right mind was trying to invest in a failing analog, low power TV station that was broadcasting Spanish Christian programming at the time. But knowing all of these challenges, I was able to get enough support from my family to help this new digital TV venture get off the ground. And what made them believers was not that I had some kind of extraordinary ability, but the fact that the communities of color in the Bay Area were so grossly underrepresented it bordered on embarrassing, and fixing that would be our focus. In short order, KAXT became the most diverse television station this nation has ever seen with new digital technology that we were first to deploy. We broadcast 20 different channels, 12 video, 8 audio, all at the same time, 24-7 local content for African American, Hispanic, Vietnamese, Chinese, Taiwanese, Korean, Indian, and Filipino communities. All of it is free and broadcast over the air. And our South Asian network, Thea TV, has taken a life of its own, and as was mentioned, now airs in many markets around the country. We even received an invitation just last week to document President Trump's first Diwali ceremony in the White House. This whole thing started just a short time ago, 2009, and I was the only addition to the station. It's really small mom and pop TV. 
For years, I would evangelize to my friends who, many of whom are working at the network level, that one day soon, people would stop paying for cable and satellite, and through a combination of rabbit ears and streaming, it would decimate the entrenched paid television marketplace as we know it. They really thought I was insane, and I have lots of emails to prove it. <laughs> but I think history has proven cord cutting is real. From there, we were able to acquire another low-power TV station, WRJK in Chicago, that to date has broadcast programming for the Chinese, Indian, and Hispanic communities, and we are just getting started. And I should also mention that serving the underserved doesn't just apply to urban areas. Case in point is our television station in Fargo, North Dakota, KRDK. The license was nearly relinquished back to the FCC to help the previous owners work their way out of what you would call a monopolistic jam that they were in. There's a long story there, but uh, we'll, we'll talk offline. Somehow we were able to acquire the license, and today our humble, our, humble telephone opera, our humble television operation produces more live and local content than every other television station in the state of North Dakota combined. That's the power of actually serving your local community with programming they really want to see and not just force-feeding them homogenized content from out of town. It would be great to leave you today with a feeling that this is the norm, but it's not. The FCC Spectrum auction is just one example where a few major telecom companies in this case and some hedge funds have been enriched and left those of us independent broadcasters in a nebulous position we may never recover from. And while I meet some incredibly well-intentioned articulate, kind people in the media sp space every time I come to DC, uh, the non-lawyers, of course. Just kidding. Yeah. Uh, the reality is we are further away from reaching adequate ownership representation than we have been in decades. I implore each one of you to do your part to form a more perfect media marketplace. We have the numbers. We just need the collective will. And I would like to leave you with some words written about Dr. Parker at the time of his retirement in 1983. Broadcasting Magazine hailed him as, quote, the founder of the citizen movement in broadcasting who spent some two decades irritating and worrying the broadcast establishment. What a legacy that would be for me and for all of you to be the irritant in the vein of the late, great Dr. Parker. Thank you all very much. Excited. That's why you saw me stumble there. Thank you, Ravi. I'm Earl Williams, the chairman of the uh, Office of Communication of the United Church of Christ. And it's my honor to introduce the recipient of the 2017 Everett Parker Award. Each year, OC Inc. presents the uh, Parker Award to an individual whose work embodies the principles and values of the public interest in telecommunications and the media the way our late founder did. Few people reflect that more than this year's honoree, Rashad Robinson, the executive director of Color of Change. Rashad is not only a talented and successful leader, but he also brings a sophisticated understanding of justice and the media to the work of his organization. Color of Change was founded in the late summer of 2005 in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. It began in the early days of online or organizing with an email exchange sent to some 1,000 people. After Rashad took over its leadership in 2011, he used the social media and online tools to build the organization to an enterprise that is now uh, having a multi-million dollar budget and more than one million members. Color of Change work has continually focused on the underlying power structures that perpetuate injustice and carefully selects its targets to get to the root of that injustice. 
Van Jones, the co-founder of Color of Change, says that instead of expecting people to simply follow his leadership, Rashad's strategy has been to use his organization's technology platform to, quote, give voice to others to let a million plus people speak for themselves. As a result, Color of Change has tackled a diverse range of issues in a variety of settings. It's framed the battle over net neutrality, as a major civil rights issue, it's challenged advertiser support of right-wing television programs and national right-wing policy organizations such as the ALEC, ALEC. And it's used its tools to help grassroots activists elect new prosecutors, bringing fresh perspectives to law enforcement decisions that could forever impact per persons' lives. And all of this, Rashad makes use of his skills as a journalist, both as the author of opinion, pieces appearing in uh, multiple formats, and as a frequent on-air commentator, <coughs> commentator. In 2015, he was honored as one of Ebony Magazine's Power 100. The same year, Fast Company cited Color of Change as one of the world's most innovative companies. The following year, the Stanford Social Innovation Review profiled his organization's strategies for, in its words, pursuing the fight for racial justice at internet speed, both online and offline. Previously, Rashad served as Senior Director of Media Programs at GLAAD, helping to foster better representation of the LGBTQ community in prime time. Today, Rashad also makes time to serve as an adjunct faculty member at the Center for Public and Nonprofit Leadership at Georgetown University's McCourt School of Public Policy. Rashad Robinson is truly one of the people making justice real on the streets of America today and using re media and media justice strategies to do it. We're honored that he has joined us today as the recipient of a 2017 Everett C. Parker Award. Rashad, would you join me here? How are we doing? It is great to be here. Um, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. It's nice to see so many familiar faces in this audience. I must first, I must first say that over the last couple of years, we've gotten a couple of amazing awards um, at Color of Change. And each time, I'm oftentimes embarrassed because um, I get the privilege and pleasure of working with and oftentimes representing the most talented, um, creative, and brilliant team um, in the nonprofit, in the social justice movement. And so these awards are it's not about me, but about not just the staff at Color of Change, not just the board, but the members, the 1.5 million members who every single day take actions to engage on the issues that matter the most. You know, I. Um, I look out in this audience and I think um, that many of us um, have been fighting these fights around um, putting two things together, media and justice. Uh, from the FCC in Washington to Airbnb and Facebook in Silicon Valley, to reality TV in Hollywood, to Fox News in Madison Avenue in New York City, to ESPN and to every football player and football field in this country. We have a, um, my, my papers are back and forth. I'm saving some uh, trees here. You know, when I, um, when I first got to GLAAD back in 2005, um, the GLAAD Awards was honoring the United Church of Christ uh, for the uh, Still Speaking campaign. Um, it made me think a lot um, as a 25-year-old who had taken this job at GLAAD, I'd come from the racial justice movement. I had a business card that now said gay on it. My um, grandmother, who once told people what I did, sort of said, oh, yeah, he's still doing the activist thing. Um, the still speaking campaign made me think a lot about what it means to break through with a message. How the core of that success is often putting two ideas together 
that people aren't just putting together very often, the God and welcome, gay and Christian, words that many in power didn't want people to hear together in one breath or see together on any sign, words that people profited from keeping apart, and words that rescued so much hope for so many people by putting them together. We put some words together ourselves at Color of Change when we put together words like net neutrality and civil rights. When we put together words like internet freedom and no black sellouts. Words like corporate power versus black power. Words can have transformative power when they are, have people behind them, when there is something at stake behind them. And the work of the UCC if there is one lesson from that campaign and so many more, is about taking charge of the special response that we have to those who love justice to change the conversation so that it actually leads to justice. Whenever we draw our strengths from, we know that change doesn't happen on its own. We have the gift of strength that we can use to lift heavy things. But I think one of the biggest lifts that we have in this moment is not just the people power that we need to mobilize, to change the institutions over our lives, but changing the narrative and the conversation about how we actually talk about it. So often in this country, when we talk about inequality and injustice, racism and poverty, we talk about those things somewhat as inconveniences, as unfortunate, almost like a car accident. And as a result, we work to build empathy for the people who are most impacted, right? How often have we had the conversations that we need to build empathy for those who are impacted by systems? And I don't think empathy is a bad thing, but I urge us all to think about now how we just build empathy, but how we build power. Because unfortunately, over and over, when we leave people at empathy, when we leave people at unfortunate, and we don't move them to power and unjust, we get the type of solutions that are not scalable for the change that we actually need. When people saw LGBT couples not being able to see their partners in the hospital as unfortunate, and they work to build empathy without power. People said that is sad that those couples can't see each other. Let's give them domestic partnership or civil unions. When people saw, see children in inner city schools that are failing, and they say that's unfortunate. We need to build empathy for those children. That's when we give big corporations having service days to clean up those schools while lobbying for the, against the policies that would actually change public education in the process. When we build empathy for people who have been trapped in an unjust system of mass incarceration in this country, we get people working to do reentry programs without dealing with the structures and the systems that put people behind bars in the first place. If we are not doing the work every single day to deal with inequality not as unfortunate like a car accident, but as an injustice that we have to work every single day to bring more people to the table, to build the type of campaigns and the strategies that change not just the culture, but force decision makers to be nervous, then we are not doing the work. And I want to say that in this moment where for the last several years, and let me get political for one quick second, President Obama and even President Bush were change candidates. President Trump is a change the rules candidate. And that's a different type of archetype. Um, because the ideas of how we make change don't necessarily operate the same way. We have to think differently about how we move the strategies and the policies and the vision for a new world that we want to see. Because the idea that you um, judicial rulings will be implemented might not actually happen under a change the rules candidate. 
The idea that we get into a room and we hash out policy, we make compromises, some people are happy, some people are unhappy, but everyone's given a little, that doesn't actually operate the same way under the change the rules county. Let me uh, give you a little more. Uh, we may have disagreed with the politics of, let's say, a housing and urban development secretary, but we knew they knew something about housing and urban development. That's what change the rules can oftentimes do. And so, we have to get out of the magical thinking that makes us think that we can do a report and give people the facts, and all of a sudden they're gonna say, aha, I see the facts, let's, let's do the right thing. That our friends in Silicon Valley can write some code and all of a sudden we can act our way out of this. That we go into the courts, we do a case, and then everything is settled and we've legaled our way out of it, or we can even start a nonprofit and nonprofit executive direct our way out of it. <laughs> it will require a new level of people power and narrative change to move ourselves out of this moment, and it will take us working collectively and across movements and across issues in ways that we have never imagined. It will take us recognizing that having faith in our ability to not just ensure that the most impacted are at the center of the conversation, but understanding that we're not doing it for charity, we are doing it for strategy. Because no movement in our country for social change has ever won without the most impacting being the writers of their own liberation. And at Color of Change, who was founded in the aftermath of a flood that was caused by bad decision makers, that turned into a life-altering disaster by those same bad decision makers, Hurricane Katrina, I still remember the images of black people on their roofs begging for the government to do something and being left to die. I see the same images in Puerto Rico right now. Katrina illustrated so much of what we know about geographic segregation, generational poverty, the impacts of climate change, what we've done to a whole set of systems. But at the heart of it, no one was nervous about disappointing black people. The government, corporations, and media, when institutions are not nervous about disappointing your community, it does not matter. So our work in this moment is to not just direct our marches at Trump as a change the rules candidate, but to direct our marches to those who, for showing up as a march, actually mean something. Sometimes to our allies, to corporate enablers, to those in government, because if we are not doing that work in this moment, if we are not doing the work to make those in power nervous about disappointing our community, we will continue to suffer, and we will go down together. So I wanna end by just once again thanking the United Church of Christ for leading. In this moment, we need large institutions like yours to create the culture in this country of challenging those who are guarding the systems and guarding the status quo. And it begins with those reaching out and seeing strategic action as imperative in the service for racial justice, gender justice, and justice for all people. That is how we transform this country, and that's how we will take this country back until justice is real. Thank you. That was amazing. Um, this is why I like this event every year. It's like you come out and you feel uh, so energized and inspired. And, um, so I am here very excited to introduce our lecturer. I am Cheryl Lianza. I am the policy advisor for the United Church of Christ's Media Justice Ministry, OC Inc. And we, um, at last summer's General Synod, the United Church of Christ adopted a resolution declaring ourselves uh, as an Im immigrant welcoming denomination. And we are delighted to welcome, again, this, uh, our lecturer, someone whose career has been dedicated to building a society where every person is welcome, no matter where they come from. 
Rinku Sen's work is inspired by, in part by her own experience as an immigrant. She, invited, she arrived at the United States as a little girl from India, learned to speak English in a two-room schoolhouse in New England. Rinku Sen is perfectly suited to present the Parker Lecture because she possesses expertise in the areas of racial justice, organizing, and journalism. Rinku has impressive credentials, a master's degree in journalism from Columbia and a degree in women's studies from Brown. Even more impressive are her results. She honed her activist chops at the Center for Third World Organizing, training organizers and developing public policy campaigns. She is the author of two books, 2003's Stir It Up, which provided a new roadmap for effective community organizing, integrating fresh perspectives on race, gender, class, poverty, and sexuality. She went on to write The Accidental American, which told the story of Moroccan immigrant Fakak Mamdou, who co-founded the Restaurant Opportunity Center of New York in the aftermath of 9-11. As president and executive director of Race Forward, the Center for Racial Justice Innovation, Rinku transformed the organization's magazine, Color Lines, into a news website that focused on such issues as voting rights, police violence, and immigration. She understood that, the qual that quality news coverage about the impact of racism on our society is not only critically important, but was sadly lacking. Race Forward has focused on how to shift the media narrative and sees that narrative as, as an essential component of the broader racial justice work. For example, Rinku was the architect of the Drop the I Word campaign, which led major US news organizations to change their style when referring to undocumented immigrants, getting rid of that I word, illegal. She taught that changing a seemingly simple adjective can lead to a change in reality, and that it can have a profound influence on our public policy debates. So after 10 years at the helm of Race Forward, Rinku has now stepped into a new role as the organization's senior strategist following its merger earlier this year with the Center for Social Inclusion. We felt this year's lecture provided a wonderful opportunity for us to benefit from her brand of reflective writing and thinking and to hear her thoughts after so many years of energetic activism on the front lines of racial justice work as she prepares for her next chapter. So I am really delighted to introduce this year's Parker Lecturer, Rinku Sen. your very tiny speaker. Thank you so much, Cheryl, for that lovely introduction. Thank you to the UCC for having me. Congratulations to Rashad and Ravi. Um, I think Cheryl imagined the three of us like going on the road together with our three R names. Rinku, Ravi, and Rashad hit the road. In 2004, I was a student at the Columbia Graduate School of Journalism. And I was writing a story about the aftermath of 9-11, which was, had only been three years before that, two and a half years before that, and about its effect on immigration policy, what happened to immigration policy after 9-11. And one of the people I interviewed for my story was a man named Peter Gadil, who was a board member of the Federation for uh, American Immigration Reform, the conservative uh, immigration restrictionist organization, FAIR. And Peter Gadiel had lost his son in uh, the attacks of September 11th. So preparing for the interview, I put my um, empathy screen on and um, was very gentle with him. Before we even started, he said to me, I insist that you use the word illegal in your story. It is the correct, accurate word. And if you don't use it, then you are hiding the truth of our immigration situation. Um, so his empathy hat was not quite as uh, tightly on as mine was. And of course I did not use the word in that story except to quote him. It, it was only in his quotes that I used the word. 
Fast forwarding to 2012, eight years later, the campaign to make the I word ubiquitous in American media had essentially succeeded. Peter Gadiel and people like him had been insisting with reporters and editors for that eight years that they had to use the I word or they were lying to Americans. And in the spring of 2012, I got a clear view of the effect of that when the National Hispanic Media Coalition which was a partner of ours in running the Drop the I Word campaign, ran a poll, and in their poll, uh, it was election season, 2012, in their poll, they found this astounding piece of data that they released that said that fully one third of the Americans that they polled thought that all Latinos in the country were quote unquote illegal immigrants. Every single Latino that they came across in the country one third of the country believed that they were all undocumented. The idea that people had been here since before the founding of the Republic had not occurred to um, any of this, these uh, hundreds of millions of people. By then, by 2012, we had been pushing back for a couple of years with the Drop the I Word campaign, trying to get the Associated Press to uh, take it out of their style guide. It would be another year before they did it. And do you know who texted me to say that they had done it? It was Rashad Robinson, who was on our board at the time and was my source of um, the AP making this enormous change. In January of 2013, when we were at the height of the use of the I word, almost 90% of the AP stories carry that word in relation to immigrants. By May of that same year, that had fallen to almost zero. So once the rule was changed, once we did not have to rely on individual reporters and editors to decide which words they were going to use, uh, in all of the AP's coverage and in the thousands of newspapers that base their coverage on the AP's coverage, uh, the use of the word had gone down to almost zero. And in those last two years of the Obama administration, we saw deportations go down also by half. I think the point is really straightforward and really simple. The way the press characterizes people determines the way the society deals with them. Uh, whether you get to live free or end up in a cage, whether you get to eat your fill or end up starving. Media coverage shapes public opinion, which then becomes the source of polling data, which then becomes the source of political action, and um, which feeds elections and policy debates. When I first wrote that sentence, I wrote, media coverage informs public opinion, but because information is so often not actually at the center of that shaping, um, I couldn't use the word inform. And what is at stake now, Rashad did a beautiful, beautiful job of laying out, we have a president who wants nothing but an adoring media that will feed his narcissism. Uh, there are constant attacks coming out of the White House on the press. Donald Trump, in the first six months of his, uh, I was gonna say his reign, because we're just about there. In the first six months of his presidency, he tweeted the words fake news 73 times. That's an average of every other day in the first six months of being president. And it doesn't include all of the outlets and reporters he tried to block from the White House press corps. It doesn't include insulting individual reporters uh, on a weekly basis. And it doesn't include suing outlets that he doesn't like. So uh, put all of that together and you essentially have daily attacks coming from the White House, from the chief executive on uh, a free press, accompanied by daily attacks on people of color, on the credibility and humanity of people of color. And so now communities of color and uh, Americans of all colors, we're in the uncomfortable position of defending a free press, a quote unquote free press, that has often produced throughout our history the actual opposite of freedom for us. It's very difficult to throw ourselves behind a free press because Donald Trump is attacking it when that free press has used its freedom to curtail ours so many times over our history. Daily newspapers in this country have a long and ugly history of ginning up fear and inciting mob violence against communities of color. Juan Gonzalez and Joseph Torres, Joseph Torres who's here in this audience, in their incredible book, News for All the People, cite dozens of examples, but I'll just give you a few. 
early newspapers fed anti-Chinese pogroms in the West. Uh, the anti-abolitionist riots of 1835 were fed by newspapers. The Camp Grad massacre of Apaches in 1871, and the armed white overthrow of elected black leadership in Wilmington, North Carolina in 1898. That is just the 19th century. And if we went to the 20th century, we would take ourselves to things like um, uh, Japanese internment and how the American public was, was encouraged to support that encouraged to demand it, in fact. Uh, we would take ourselves to uh, desegregation and the end of Jim Crow and the ways in which Southern communities were, were incited to resist that. So the question for communities of color, for people of color, is in this country, can we have any expectation of not just a free press in our country, but also of a fair one? Can we expect not just a free press, but also a fair one? What does a modern, free, and responsible press have to do with racial justice? What do journalists owe the subjects of their stories? And to whom are they accountable? What should communities demand from their press? It's been established, I think, for a long time that ob objectivity is not the standard for us to demand. It isn't the standard because objectivity assumes somehow that reporters, journalists, unlike other human beings, are capable of identifying their own internal biases and dealing with them in the course of reporting and publishing a story. We have found that, of course, not to be the case. Objectivity is impossible precisely because it is subjectively defined. It is defined by whoever owns uh, the printing press or the radio airwaves or the internet at the time, what is objective. And so objectivity being mitigated as it is by blind spots and by strategically hidden biases, that cannot be our standard. And if that is not our standard, then what are the set of standards that we should demand the American press be um, loyal to? There are three that, uh, three themes that I've thought of that we should be thinking about a lot. The first, of course, is to hold the press accountable to doing no racial harm. Doing no racial harm. It's a fairly low standard, but I think um, a good one. The second is that we have to pay attention to technology because every t wave of technology changes our media situation and provides new opportunities for injustice but also for justice. And the third is to support local and independent journalism. So doing no racial harm first. I would call this this lesson something like don't be racist, but given that the majority of Americans think of racism as only individual, intentional, and overt acts, only if there is a noose hanging will we be able to name that racism exists. Given that that is the standard by which most Americans judge racism, and that is frankly too low a standard because so much racial harm can be done without individual, intentional, and overt uh, action, that that can't be the way that we decide to do no racial harm. So the way we decide to do no racial harm is to demand that the press um, treat everyone with the respect that they deserve that gets them accurate representation. All of us have the right to be represented truly, uh, not by a stereotype, not by a set of um, uh, assumptions. Chinua Achebe, the great uh, writer wrote on the risks of being a foreign correspondent. He said, there is also the moral danger of indulging in sensationalism and dehumanizing the sufferer. This danger immediately raises the question of the character and attitude of the correspondent, because the same qualities of mind which in the past separated a Conrad from a Livingston or a Gainsborough from the anonymous painter Francis Williams, they are still present and still active in the world today. Perhaps this difference can best be put in one phrase, the presence or absence of respect for the human person. Respect, though, goes deeper than simply getting the facts right. It really speaks to checking the assumptions that reporters and editors and journalists have when they are reporting on communities. Uh, when we check those assumptions, we might find that, in fact, they are just cultural tropes. They are just stereotypes that have lived in our society for hundreds of years, like the idea that illegal is the correct term, mostly because it has the word legal embedded in it. 
Um, if we look at the coverage of different groups of color, we can see that the uh, media coverage is, is shaped by these assumptions. Numerous studies of media coverage of Latinos have shown that 95% of stories about Latinos in this country have to do with immigration, and most of them with quote unquote illegal immigration. Most of the stories about black communities have to do with criminal justice. And even if their story is about our struggle for, for um, change in these areas in, in immigration policy and criminal justice policy, still, black people and Latinos, they do a lot of things other than migrate and struggle with the criminal justice system. They do the things that all Americans do, but they never get reported on. Asians and Native people are pretty much absent from the mainstream media get no coverage whatsoever uh, because they don't know how to cover us. <laughs> it's easy for implicit bias to control our reporting and editing. Implicit bias is a set of associations we make in our brains so quickly that we are not even aware that we are making them. And they have a lot to do with us judging who belongs and who doesn't, who is in our group and who isn't, um, so that we can protect ourselves from strangers, uh, the very opposite of the uh, love of strangers and love of neighbors uh, morality that this, this church holds true to. Implicit bias isn't a moral failing, it is a scientific fact. It does not mean that uh, we are bad people, it means that our brains do things that we don't have control of all of the time. And the way that we deal with implicit bias and its effect on the news and its effect on communities of color is to focus on the impact that news outlets are having rather than the intention that they claim in doing their work. When we were doing Drop the I Word, outlet after outlet said, oh, but we don't intend to denigrate Latino people. And yet, if you Google uh, images, Latinos, uh, images and illegal, the word illegal, all that comes up is images of Latino men. Um, low income Latino men who struggle really hard to uh, put our food on the table and to get our buildings up. But that is, uh, the word illegal has become so synonymous with Latino men that that is the only set of images you will get from a Google search. We have to teach our people to consume news critically because uh, the more often you see a word used, the more you think that it is the proper word. Editors and readers alike would insist that the I word was the proper word, when in fact, once we started talking to lawyers, they said, oh, we never use that word because it's so imprecise. People can be out of status for dozens of reasons, and in the courts, we want to know what the reasons are, not what the stereotype is. The terms um, used in court might be out of status, in process, lapsed, asylum seeker, and so, long, so on. From a storytelling angle, too, the word illegal doesn't do very much. It doesn't tell you where people came from, doesn't tell you how they uh, decided to stay, it doesn't tell you how they made the decision to do something that they knew would be punishable by the law, but that they had reasons to do anyway. So it wasn't the natural, proper, legal word, and yet it was the perfect word to run an immigration restrictionist agenda on. Um, in our work, we described in detail a memo by Frank Luntz. Frank Luntz is a brilliant Republican pollster. I agree with almost none of his politics, but I learn a ton from the way he does his work. Frank Luntz was charged by the Republican Party with coming up with uh, talking points and messages on immigration. And in 2004, 2005, in his memo, he says, actually, Americans don't care very much. They're not concerned about immigration. They have other worries, the economy being at the top of the list, terrorism being at the top of the list. And he said, but what Americans do is think of themselves as law and order people, law-abiding people. And so if you want to make a break in the way Americans feel about immigration, what you have to do is cast the whole thing in law and order terms. Um, use the word illegal immigrant as much as you can. Now, interestingly, Frank Luntz said, um, do not ever use the word illegals as a noun. He said, a noun, that's racist. Adjective, that's okay. Um, and man, I am a grammar geek, and would that Americans knew the difference between adjectives and nouns. <laughs> Then they'd stop you know, writing irregardless everywhere and putting commas after every third word just because that little swoop is so nice, looks like the Nike swoosh, you know. 
Um, so Frank Lund said, don't ever use it as a noun. But of course, in the mouths of everyday Americans, illegal immigrant quickly becomes um, uh, illegal alien and quickly becomes just illegals. So um, instructing conservatives never to use the noun did not, in fact, work. Um, and what, it, uh, what we ended up with was tons and tons of coverage of undocumented immigrants, all as Latinos. There are half a million um, undocumented immigrants from Europe in this country. In my neighborhood, in Rigo Park, Queens, they tend to be Russians and Uzbeks and uh, Ukra Ukrainians. And it's quite common to, for me to be in my neighborhood diner and to overhear a conversation next to me about who um, in my Russian Uzbek community, who's got papers and who's, who doesn't. Uh, once I heard a man telling another man uh, about his wife, um, but she had papers, it wasn't an immigration marriage. She was like, I fell in love, I think she loves me. Wasn't an immigration marriage, but everybody's white. Uh, one of the things that has changed so much in the 30 years I've been doing racial justice work is that we have entirely new groups of people of color in this country before 9-11, Arab, South Asians, Middle Easterners often didn't think of themselves as people of color. And we have entirely new groups of white people as well. That is the power of a media. That's what can happen. So um, one of the things we have to do is make our outlets really deal with their racial impact, not just their racial intention. Second thing we have to do is pay attention to technology. In 10 years, we will no longer have iPhone neck because we will no longer have iPhones. We won't be like this all the time, giving our chiro chiropractors business um, because because our devices will be in our glasses, they'll be on our watches, and the entire world will be our screen. I'll be able to uh, look out at whatever I'm looking at, this audience for example, press something on my watch, and pull up a Google fact and it'll show up right here in front of me as though the air itself is a screen. So with that kind of technology coming, we have to think a lot about fake news. We have to get our media outlets to think about technology and prepare for it. Because you know the kind of thing that's going to be possible? Someone's going to be able to take a photo of Donald Trump and, uh, or a video and put literal words in his mouth, put words in his mouth saying things like, um, I love black communities and I'm going to protect them uh, for as long as I'm president. N nothing that we can believe, but all over the country then people will think that Donald Trump loves black people. Kanye West will have um, new, new presidents to, to talk about. So technology is going to cause changes in production and changes in consumption and we have to be able to pressure not just media outlets to uh, be prepared for those changes so that they're in fact not giving us fake news that somebody created on a bot in a computer in a studio somewhere, but giving us real news so that they can be not credulous, but actual, um, uh, actual purveyors of real news. If we don't do that, media consolidation is going to continue, and uh, that consolidation is going to lead to all kinds of fake news going out into the world. We're going to have less actual news in general. We're going to have few, less news from reporters of color. We're going to have more fake news, and Americans are going to have less confidence in the media. If we let that happen, then what is at stake is nothing less than the dream of a multiracial pluralistic democracy that um, Americans of color have long held for hundreds of years. One way to not let that happen is to support all of the local independent journalism that we can. That kind of local journalism is breaking stories all the time. It broke the Michael Brown story in Ferguson. A great outlet in Oakland, California broke the story about sexual, uh, commercial sexual exploitation of teenage girls in West Oakland, uh, teenage girls of color. We need to trade, use that local independent uh, new way of making media to train new generations of reporters. On the Color Line staff now, our entire editorial staff, the, the women who, who edit our uh, site, 
The way they learned to be reporters is that when they were teenagers, when they were in high school, they did internships at their local daily newspaper. Now, such internships are not available. Even the jobs at local daily newspapers are not available. So without local independent media, we are not going to have next generations of well-trained reporters because there won't be anywhere for them to actually get trained. In doing the work on immigration and on the I word, one of the things that I came across was that conflict between the rule of one kind of law and the rule of another kind of law. We had the rule of political law that led so many news, news outlets to use the I word, but that came up against the rule of moral law Moral law says we don't dehumanize people. It says we don't lump entire communities under a stereotype. It says that we don't lie about what people have done or are doing or what they contribute. Moral law is the law that the UCC, I believe, runs from. It is the law that has to drive our political laws. Um, but moral laws and political laws often have to be negotiated. Our country has a long history of negotiating that gap between political law and moral law. And we haven't always landed on the side of moral law. Sometimes we have landed on the side of immoral political law. Uh, because that history has been so testy, people love to hate journalists. I think people love to hate us as much as they love to hate politicians and lawyers, um, perhaps more. Thomas Jefferson said, the man who reads nothing at all is better educated than the man who reads nothing but newspapers. Even Mahatma Gandhi, who supposedly loved everybody, said, I believe in equality for everyone except reporters and photographers. <laughs> But Jefferson and Gandhi were wrong. They were wrong. Journalism is worth defending and it's worth doing. At stake in modern journalism is the answer to Vincent Harding's seminal question and heartbreaking question, is America possible? If we have good, fair, and free media, then a multiracial pluralistic democracy as America, that is possible. If we don't have it, it is not possible. At stake are the lives of actual human beings. Some people say that this multiracial pluralistic democracy thing is just going to happen. We're going to um, be a diverse community, country, we're gonna meet each other, we're gonna fall in love, we're gonna date, we're gonna get married, we're gonna have all these babies that are all kind of vaguely multiracial um, with quote unquote exotic looking hair and skin and eyes. Um, and everybody will love the multiracial babies. But the thing is, we cannot bang our way to this multiracial pluralistic <laughs> democracy. It's just not gonna happen. Um, and in fact, it has not happened in the history of the world. We are a young country and we're still in the process of founding it. We are, we are the founding mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters of this country. Egypt, founded in 5000 BC, Morocco, 1666, China, 1800 BC, Croatia, 925. I understand that countries go through different expressions over the course of centuries, but you can see that 300 measly years heading toward it is, is nothing. We're still working so many of these things out. And in this moment, we are on the brink of the most credible movement toward state takeover of our media that we have seen in my lifetime. That is the threat that is in front of us. And if that happens, then multiracial pluralistic democracy is definitely not happening. We have no choice now, really, to, but to both de defend the press, defend the free press, and drive it toward new disruptions that can actually deliver news for all of the people. A free press can be good or bad, Albert Camus said. Camus said, but most certainly without freedom, it, the press will never be anything but bad. The great anti-lynching journalist Ida B. Wells said, the people must know before they can act, and there is no educator to compare with the press. I understand cynicism about media. I had some of it myself, frankly, going into journalism school at, at Columbia. But once I was in journalism school, it turned out that I actually really loved the work. So much of it is like organizing, getting strangers to tell you intimate things about their lives because they trust your, uh, they trust that you're going to do right by them. Uh, I love the work and I found that it changed me. I am less gullible now that I'm a journalist, but more open. I'm less knowing, but more questioning. 
I'm less about making my mark and more about actually experiencing the world around me. The Americans of so many different identities, the millions all invested in the yet to be realized dream of a multiracial pluralistic democracy, whose populace finds in their press the means to understand each other. Grace Lee Boggs, who put in a cool 100 years on this earth making social change, wrote in an essay called I Must Love the Questions Themselves. Even if the people of our respective communities or of our country are acting in ways that we believe are unworthy of human beings, we must still care enough for them so that their lives and ours, their questions and ours, become inseparable. I trust us, all of the people in this room, to love both the people and the questions enough to not only defend a free press corps, but to make it a free and fair press corps, to actually be that free and fair press corps. It won't be easy, but it is entirely possible. Everything is possible because we are here willing to make it so. Thank you so much. for your provocative words. After all the inspiring messages we have heard today, we wanted to send you out with a song. Today we are honored to welcome Dr. Duan Rees, the Curator of Music and Performing Arts for the Smithsonian's National Music Museum of African American History and Culture to sing Aaron Copeland's arrangement of the song, Simple Gifts. Duan is a member of First Congregational Church and she is accompanied today by John Horman, the church's music director. Thank you, Juan and John. Thanks to all of our honorees, and thanks to all of you for joining us again this year. We hope that you've been inspired by our time together this morning.
Alles Gute.